Okay. All right. The recording is on. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the class BC209 on holiness, the first lecture for this week. And we'll have sorry, we'll have another one on Wednesday morning. Let's pray. Get started. Can I request somebody to pray with the class this morning? And then we'll start. Okay, everybody's very quiet. All right, somebody please pray and we can get started. Can I pray? Go ahead, say. All right, Divya. Shall I pray? Shall I pray? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Lord, for this uh, wonderful opportunity that you've given us, Lord, to come before your presence, Lord, to learn from you, uh, Father, Lord, to learn about the holiness, Father. We do not completely comprehend, Father, but we pray, Lord, by the Holy Spirit, you help us understand, Lord, uh, to get a glimpse of your holiness, Father, that we may, Father, live lives of holiness, Lord, just as you are holy. Lord, help us be holy, Father, in our thoughts, in our words, in our deeds, Lord. We surrender ourselves, Lord. We surrender Pastor Rashish, Lord, into your loving hands, Lord. May you guide him, Lord, and may he speak your very words to us, Lord. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. Amen, man. All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining the class on holiness. We, I'm just going to quickly review what we started doing in chapter two, and uh, then we want to be going forward. So what we're dealing with in chapter one, chapters one and two, is trying to get a revelation, a spiritual understanding of the holiness of God and uh, various aspects of God's holiness. And then in chapter three, we'll go on into talking about how that holiness, God wants it to be reproduced in us. So right now we're still trying to get an understanding of the holiness of God, a revelation of that holiness. So let's go to chapter two, the notes have been shared with you, I'll just quickly review some of the things. We've already covered this. So we um, talked about the fact that God is referred to as the Holy One, the Holy One. And uh, he's, he's thoroughly holy, completely holy. And uh, when he is worshiped, he's worshiped. The holiness of God is what's uh, emphasized in worship you know we say he's he's holy 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 thrice holy and um, we uh, are holy to the third degree uh, god is completely holy there's a complete recognition of his uh, holiness uh, uh, and you know God is absolutely holy. He is, he is, you could say, the standard or the highest expression of holiness, of this purity, of this perfection. And it's that aspect of God that is worshipped uh, in the presence of God by the angelic beings. And so you and I, in our worship of God, must include the worship of his holiness. Now, we do recognize oh, and worship God in all of the other aspects, meaning his power, his goodness, and, uh, you know, his kindness, his forgiveness, all of the aspects. Yeah, we do worship God in all of the aspects of his, who he is, of God's nature, right? We do worship. But, 
simply because in the worship that's going on in heaven, what is emphasized or what is revealed to us in scripture is that these angelic beings are worshiping his holiness, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. So therefore, our worship of God must include this uh, awesome recognition of his holiness, his absolute sinlessness. So I want us to pause and think here as we are getting a revelation of the holiness of God. How much of our worship of God and our worship towards God is you know, involves this recognition. You know, we said earlier last week, every aspect of God is undergirded, is intertwined with holiness from the previous chapter. There's no aspect of God that can be separated from the holiness of God. God is holy. So in as much as we worship God, our worship of God must also take place in the beauty of holiness. Like we said, holiness is God's beauty expressed. And he wants us to worship in the beauty of holiness. So think about that. Our worship of God must include a recognition of his holiness. Another aspect as we move forward is uh, there are many, many scriptures, and I've tried to list all these out here, but God, God's name is to be held with reverence. His holy name, many times, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Holy name. And God wants us to hold his name holy. So even in, this, in the Lord's Prayer, when Jesus taught us, he said, hallowed be your name. It's a very interesting part. Why is he telling us this? You know, why is he saying, hallowed be your name? Because throughout the scriptures, his name is holy. Hallowed be your name. That means when we mention his name, there has to be a sense of holiness, a sense of awe and reverence towards that name. And in, in, in scripture, and especially in the Old Testament, God wants us. We see it's part of the commandments. So you, Ten Commandments. You will not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. That means don't use this in an empty way, in a light way. You hallow the name of God. And uh, there were times when God judged his people, and I've just mentioned some here you know, from Ezekiel, that as God judged his people because they profaned his name. That means they did not hold his name holy. They profaned or they you know, treated it very lightly. They profaned my name where they went. They didn't hold his name. Holy. So think about this that God wants us to hold his name with reverence as part of our understanding of the holiness of God. We hold his name with reverence. Now, sometimes we don't do that. 
you know, we, in his name, we speak and say very frivolous things in his name, in his name, you know, we may do things that are actually not from him, but then we add his name to it. Oh, God told me, and I'm doing this in Jesus' name, etc., etc., and we are not actually uh, holding his name with reverence. And just as a side note, and I don't want to take I don't want to take this too far, but that word profane actually means to pierce, to wound. So. If we understand it correctly, when God is saying they profane my holy name, it's almost like we are wounding or piercing God himself okay, in bringing dishonor uh, to his name and dishonoring his name or treating it lightly. So part of our reverence towards God and part of our understanding of holiness must include this reverence to his holy name. Okay, let me just see. I think there's a question. Somebody raised a hand in the chat. Okay, thank you. Excuse me, sir. Yes, go ahead, Maggie. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, speaking on... on on the name of God. The question I have, sir, is when it says that we should not take his name in vain, is it uh, because of our, our actions are damaging his name? Because people, we are called in his name. When, when we, 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 we worship him, when we go to church, when we, we preach or talk about him, we are presenting his name. So when he says that, do not take my name in, in vain, is it because of what we do? His reputation is, is affected by what we do. Because if we look, uh, look at the example of Moses, when he struck, he struck the, the rock, God said that he didn't take his, he didn't represent him, him well before Israelite. That's a question I answer. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, I think uh, yeah, uh, reputation or bringing reproach to the name of God is is a factor. But I think even before that, what God is really looking for is hallowing or holding with reverence His name in our hearts. So. If we hallow his name, if we uh, hold his name with reverence, we would be very careful in how we say and do things in his name. And that I think is uh, the main thing. So many times we say and do things very uh, in a very in a very frivolous manner, very light manner. It's not coming out of a place of reverence towards God and towards Him. We're not hallowing His name, but we say in in, in the Lord's name, in Jesus' name, whatever you know, uh, we say and do things. Now that, of course, has its repercussion, which uh, the outcome, which is you know, some, we we may end up bringing a disrepute to the name of God. But that is, I think, uh, an outcome. Uh, the main issue is our heart. Am I holding his name with reverence? So let me put it like this. If I hold his name with reverence, it will actually keep me from saying something wrong or doing something wrong in his name. If I hold his name in reverence, the thing that is uppermost, the thing that will be uppermost in my mind is, 
even, I'm going to do something. It, does this please him? Is it right for me, who bears the name of Christ, to do this? See, that's the way I would think. I mean, anyone would think. I'm just using, I'm just saying I, but that's the way we would think when we hold his name in reverence, when we hallow his name. Why? Because you and I are bearing his name. So, you know, uh, would it please him? Is this worthy of somebody who's carrying his name? Right? So the, where does that come from? It comes from the fact that when we hallow his name, it automatically keeps us from saying and doing things that are just not pleasing to him. We say, look, this is not worthy of somebody who is bearing that name or worshiping that name. And I think Paul, you know, I, I'm just going a little off here, but in Second Timothy chapter 2, Paul says that everyone who, you know, this is in verse 19, Second Timothy 2, 19, Paul says, let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Right, so it's look, if you are naming the name of Christ, that's it. I don't want to, you know, we just depart because you're, you're a bearer of that name. Does that help, Mandy? Yes, that help. That's help. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, sir. Right. Okay, I'm going to go back to the PDF and please feel free to ask questions. Oh. Okay, let me get back. Christopher, you were, so I was just moving to the PDF. Go ahead with your question, please. Uh, yes, Pastor, I was uh, just referring to, the, in this chapter, uh, referring to this, um, this um, uh, you know, the worship that happens uh, in, in heaven. And um, I'm just going to actually understand um, when, when, there are there are so many um, uh, you know, heavenly heavenly uh, uh, spirits that are in heaven. Um, this 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 aspect of holiness are there are there, are there levels of holiness um, uh, on you know on the part of of, of the people of the or of this of these spirits uh, in heaven and. Um, um, whether the, you know there is there there, there is some level of um, um, I, don't, I don't want to say unholiness, but um, you know because I mean uh, they, we had, there were there were the you know uh, you know there were these angelic beings who who turned away from God and that as I understand happened in heaven. So just trying to understand. Uh, uh, you know, are there levels of holiness, and um, uh, you know, um, are there also levels of uh, unholiness? So, yeah, I mean, uh, that that's basically the question. Um, in heaven, as far as heaven is concerned, I think there's only one uh, in heaven. There is only one uh, standard of holiness, which is God. And everything derives its holiness from God and therefore is of the same standard as God in heaven. And the reason I say that is, you know, we are going to see just a little further in the notes. It says, holiness adorns your house. It means, you know, God's house, where God dwells, is uh, adorned, or if you want to say it like this, it's clothed or covered with His holiness. So, in that realm, in the realm where God dwells, there's only one standard and there's only one level of holiness, which is the holiness of God Himself in that realm. 
and it is true and sometimes unimaginable for us how in such a perfect state could sin be found which happened right when Lucifer who was in this house where holiness adorned the house in this state of absolute glory and perfection could get this thought of you know wanting to take the place of God anyway but to answer your question in that place there's only one standard it's God now when you come to the earth realm that is where we are then there we can say there are degrees of holiness and uh, that's something we're going to learn I'll just mention a reference or uh, second Corinthians chapter 7 verse 1 and also Hebrews 12 uh, I think it's verse 14 where it, in 2 Corinthians 7 1 says you know let us cleanse ourselves of all filthiness of flesh and spirit perfecting holiness in the fear of God so that is our realm we are to perfect the word perfect also means to keep growing in so we are growing in Hebrews 12 14 it says uh, uh, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man will see the Lord and if you just back up a few verses in, uh, in that same chapter Hebrews 12 talks about God who disciplines us for our to perfect holiness in us so there so from our perspective in our journey there is degrees of holiness so there's the growth in holiness but in heaven where God dwells there's only one standard we will see in scripture his holiness adorns his house is that okay yeah yeah thank yeah. you okay all right let's go forward um So what we be saying, yeah, we were talking about how God desires for us to hallow his name. That means to, to reverence, to hold his name with holiness. Yeah, and we are going through several different thoughts and each one of these we can really ponder on. But I'm going a little fast because uh, there's a lot of ground we have to cover. All right. So. And God has let us know, he's, he's, he's revealed to us that he dwells, he's going to reside where his whole name is held with reverence. Which also means he's going to not reside or he's going to hesitate to abide where his name is treated lightly or even profaned that means they are wounded and pierced so if we apply it to our new testament context we know jesus taught us the same thing he said look you know if you gather together in my name i'm coming there but what are we supposed to do with his name hallowed be your name we have to reverence the name of the Lord so in our life as God's people as a community as a, maybe a local church uh, as people who worship God uh, as people who bear the name of Jesus as people who do things in the name of Jesus is there that reverence for his name that's something we should carry in our hearts that's part of our understanding part of our revelation of the holiness of God the other thing we said is that God speaks in holiness you know, and I like this scripture here you know psalm 108 verse 7 and also in psalm 60 verse 6 god says i mean these scriptures say god has spoken 
in holiness. That, that is when God is speaking, whatever he's saying, it's the Holy One speaking. But God is emphasizing, look, I have spoken in my holiness. In other words, could there be anything wrong with what God has said? Could there be anything wrong? Because this is the Holy One speaking, and whatever he speaks is spoken in holiness. You know, when you, I mean, in the natural realm, in, in, in the earth realm, if we know somebody who is, you know, a perennial liar, then when they say something, you're wondering, did they actually say what's right? Or did they say something, are they lying? You know, we are in doubt of what they said. But when it comes to God, He is holy. So what He speaks is spoken in holiness. Therefore, there can be no, you know, element of impurity in it. Or if you look at how God was speak in, in Psalm 89, how it is said, it, how it is expressed, you know, God has said, look, I have spoken once. I will not lie to David. And he's talking about, you know, his, his, his throne being established. But God is saying, look, I've sworn in my holiness. I've spoken in my holiness. I will not lie. Meaning it's what I've spoken, I've spoken with absolute purity. There is no lie in it. Right? So that's another aspect of God's holiness, that his words are expressed in holiness. It's the Holy One speaking. And therefore his words are holy, his words are pure. And it's interesting. The Bible is called the Holy Bible. Why? Because the Holy God spoke it. When you open the Bible, you're reading the words of the Holy One. You're reading the words that have been spoken in holiness. And so we regard his word that way. Interesting is that these angelic beings are also referred to as holy angels. All the holy angels are referred to as holy one or holy ones, so on. Just like us, we also are referred to as holy ones. We are saints, holy ones. Angels are also referred to as holy angels. These created beings have been created as holy beings to stand in the presence of the holy one. So God created them like that. Fully, completely consecrated, set apart for God, pure, holy. The only thing that the angels have and we have, of course, is we can make our choice. We can choose to do something that's unholy. We are created with the, with the free will, with the ability to choose, unlike, you know, inanimate things. We have the, God has given us the freedom to choose, but he created them as holy beings. Today, when we are born again, we have brought into that same place of being holy beings, giving us the ability to stand in his presence. So, what we can say is that holiness will attract the holy angels of God. But they are holy beings. And so they, they are created for this holiness. And like I referred to earlier, the Bible says in Psalm 93 verse 5, that the place where God dwells is adorned with holiness. 
So, you know, when, when we decorate our house, you know, we put out things that, that we like, that we like to say, you know, hey, see this, this is like what stands out in my home. This is what's special to me. All well, this is what I like, you know, whether it's works of art or whether it's plants or whatever, you know, different people have different things that they like to decorate their house with. And here he's saying, a psalm, the psalmist is telling us, God adorns his house. You know, he wraps his home. He covers his home. He decorates his home in holiness. And so you find a lot of uh, scriptures in relation to that. The place where he is is called the holy hill, the holy place, the holy sanctuary, the holy temple, the holy throne, or his holy habitation, meaning everything about where God dwells is holy. It's absolutely pure and perfect. His perfections fill the place where he dwells. Now, what we need to think now, of course, in the Old Testament, these, the, you know, the physical tabernacle, there was the 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 most holy the holy um uh, the the most holy place the inner court and then the most holy place but what i want to point out is you know spiritually when we worship god spiritually when we worship god on our side we are referred to as the temple of god And he says, the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Now we know, okay, that, that the place where God dwells is absolutely holy. And then he's saying, you are the place where God dwells, and therefore you are holy. So what would God want this temple, meaning I'm talking about us, New Testament, about us? What would God want to adorn this house with? He would want to adorn this house with holiness. He wants to decorate you. He wants to decorate me with holiness. Now we can think about it individually, or we can think about it collectively, meaning as the people of God, you know, the, the church or the house of God. God wants to decorate, he wants to adorn his temple, his dwelling place. I'm talking about the church, the New Testament. We are his dwelling place. So he wants to adorn us with holiness, just like he adorns heaven where he dwells with holiness. So let's think about that. The local church, or the local church, meaning the community of believers, should be decorated, should be adorned with this holiness, with the purity of God. So when the outside world sees the church, sees the people of God, the thing that should really stand out is the holiness of God. I'm not saying the only thing, because we are called to so forth the praises of the one who's called us of a darkness into his marvelous light, which means all of this, all of his attributes. But if God adorns his home with holiness, then obviously when the outside world sees us, the temple, dwelling place of God, something that really should strike them is these people are holy. You know, something to think about and, 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 and pray for and aspire towards. I'm not trying to say, do this as a you know, way to condemn us, but I'm saying, look, we are the house of God and God adorns his house with holiness. Another continuing thought, God says, you know, I must be regarded as holy. So this is interesting because as part of our revelation, we also must understand that it is important to God to be regarded as holy. 
God who is holy shall be hallowed. It almost, almost seems redundant to say this. Almost seems redundant. God says, by those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. I mean, it's almost like, why do you want to say it? Because you are holy. You are perfectly holy. But I think God is sharing his heart with us. You know, suppose you had a friend. You'd want a friend to tell you, you know, what's really important to you so that I could be aware of it, I could respect it, I could you know, relate, I could honor that. And God is telling us his heart. And one of the things in his heart is, by those who come near me, I must be hallowed. I must be regarded as holy. I know this is Old Testament, but God hasn't changed. And we see it repeated in the New Testament. So I'm holy, be holy. So it's it's not like I can disregard this just because it's Old Testament. I must understand the heart of God that, but those who come near him, and I want to draw near to God. You know, we know the scripture. So draw near to God. He will draw near to you. Okay. But how must I draw near to God? I must be, he said, by those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. So God has expressed his heart saying, regard me or hallow me in holiness, right? So in the New Testament, Hebrews 12, he says that when we serve God or worship God or you know whatever we do, minister to God, how do we serve God? He says, you serve him with reverence and godly fear. Same, same, same thought being expressed also in the New Testament, one of the places. When we minister to God, when we worship God, when we praise God, when we draw near to God, he says, do so with reverence and godly fear or with whole. You know, regarding him holy. So, how do we do that? Or are we doing that? Right? Now, I'm not saying that every time we pray, we always demean ourselves. Now, that's not what God is telling us because we know that he tells us to come boldly to the throne of grace. He tells us to come with confidence. He tells us, you know, uh, we have boldness to enter into the holiest through the blood of Jesus. So there is that aspect where God says, you know, come freely, come boldly, come with confidence. But there is also this aspect of come with reverence, come with godly fear, come draw near to me, regarding me as holy. So. It has to be held together. The entrance that is with full freedom and knowing that we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ, knowing that there is no condemnation has to be held together with those who draw near to me. I must be regarded as holy. And remember we said last class, last week, the holiness of God is the beauty of God. It draws us to him. We're in love with that, we're attracted to him because he's holy. So we worship in the beauty of holiness and it, it, it's very comfortable for us because he's made us holy and we regard him as holy. So, 
the reason I'm highlighting this is in our worship today, I mean worship, I mean just looking at the church world in general, and especially in the uh, you know what we refer to as the emerging church or the contemporary church or the postmodern church, you know, people use different terms. When we have so much of uh, exhibition in the worship, that means there's the exhibition of talent, there's the exhibition of um, art, there's the exhibition of all the, the, the fine things that we can do. Are we still able to maintain this, which is when you draw near to me, or we must worship with reverence and godly fear. Are we able to maintain that? I'm not against the use of instruments and you know being very good and all of that, you know, okay, fine. But if you miss out on this, then we miss out on the whole aspect of worship. So that's something to think about. In our revelation of God, it should be very clear. In our revelation of the holiness of God, it should be very clear that God wants to be held, regarded as holy. He has expressed his heart to us. We cannot take that lightly. I'm going to pause here, see if there are any questions in the chat. All right. Um, okay. Um, Brother Manoa has asked a question, Second Corinthians 7, 1. Uh, let us cleanse us of all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. Question is, some explanation on cleansing ourselves in the spirit will be helpful. Okay. Okay. All right, let me try to say this in a very short way. And we will, I think there is, um, in chapter five, we are dealing, we will be dealing with this in, in a little bit more depth um, in this section on um, this whole aspect of uh, filthiness of flesh and spirit. But let me say it in a very quick way. Uh, so, Sin is not just a physical thing. That means, suppose I example, right? Suppose a believer steals money. Okay, he takes, he steals a certain amount of money. So in the physical, he's done, done something wrong. Okay, he's taken some money here. That's a physical thing. Uh, maybe, you know, what motivated, uh, so the, the issue is, his act was wrong, yes. He, but what motivated that? Uh, there could be, and, and uh, there could be many things. It could be uh, deception, lying, greed, uh, wrong desire. So many things. So it's not just the act. Okay, he took some money here. That's a physical act thing that was done. But there's a spiritual side to it that led to that act. So there's filthiness, flesh and spirit. What was the motive? What was inside the heart? And Jesus said in Matthew 12, you know, out of the heart comes, out of the heart comes. And then he lists all the evil things, you know adulteries and this and evil thoughts and those. And that. So there's things out of the heart coming. So here's something to think about, which we will also discuss in our other class on developing the human spirit. The born again human spirit has a life in the nature of God. And yet, there's sin that can affect the born again human spirit. Okay. These, these wrong things wrong motives, stealing, whatever, whatever. 
can affect the born again human spirit. So the born again human spirit has a life in the nature of God. And yet there's this sin that can come. And that's why Paul is saying, cleanse ourselves of all filthiness of flesh and spirit. I hope that quickly understands, but we're going to delve into that deeper in chapter five in the course on holiness and also in this course on uh, developing the human spirit. Okay. Um, Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Uh, Elijah, does God hear the prayer of an unholy believer? Okay. Hmm. How do I answer that? Elijah asked a question. Does God hear the prayer of an unholy believer? Okay. Now, why am I struggling to answer that question? Because there are scriptures on one side, like uh, Psalm 66, verse 18. If I regard sin in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Uh, First Peter chapter 3, uh, I think it's verse 8, that um, he's talking to husbands. Husbands, if you don't treat your wives well, your prayers will be hindered. So there are scriptures like that. And then there are, you know, scriptures that tell us that as believers, you know, we can talk to God freely and so on. So that's why I'm kind of struggling to answer that question. Um, so let me put it like this, Elisha. I, I don't know the correct answer to it, but see, the Bible does say, that our prayers can be hindered because of sin. And yet we know there is the mercy of God, which means in spite of sin, God hears. Whether Old Testament, New Testament, you find examples. So what we don't know is exactly at what point a person goes out of range in their connectivity to God. I don't know. I know it's possible that you can go out of range, but at what point? Perhaps you can put it like this, you know, that if a, if a believer is, you know, the way John puts it in First John chapter three is, you know, we have to practice righteousness. So if a believer is actually practicing, starts practicing unrighteousness, you can imagine it like this, that their connectivity with God is getting interrupted. And if they're not, if they're not repenting, see, we all do wrong things. Like First John chapter one talks about it. But if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. But he also says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. So the, 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 it's conditional. I walk in the light as he's in the light. We have fellowship. But if a believer is stepping out of that place of walking in the light and stepping into willfully going on into practicing unrighteousness, his connectivity with heaven is getting interrupted. At what point? He loses connectivity, I don't know. But I do know that's possible because there are several, several scriptures, you know, I'm just, I think it's First John 5, 19. It says, if a brother sins a sin unto death, I, I say, don't even pray for it. That means not only is he out of connection, he's saying, don't even pray for his connection to be restored, which is a pretty serious thing. Okay. So, I don't know the exact answer to your question, Elisha. I, I would say this, God has a lot of mercy. So even if a believer is, you know, you know, doing some sin, God in his mercy will hear, but at some point, the believer is going to go out of that place of his connectivity with God. It's not God's fault, but the believer stepping out, I would, I would look at it that way. Okay. 
All right, so time's up for today. Uh, there's a lot, lot more we need to get in. Uh, but uh, are these things settling into our hearts? Uh, are you all with me? Is it getting in? You're understanding this. Yes, Pastor. Yeah. Okay, I see your responses in the chat. Thank you. All right. So we're going to take this further on Wednesday. Go further into it. Okay. Can somebody uh, close in prayer and then we will dismiss for today? Who wants to pray? Call somebody's name. All right. Shri Kumar, why don't you pray? I'll pray. Okay. All right. Kennedy, yes. go ahead. Yes, sir. <laughs> okay. Go ahead, Shri Kumar. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Precious Father, we thank you and praise you for this wonderful day which you have given to us, God. We pray that, Father God, give us grace and wisdom and revelation to know your holiness so that we can, Lord, master walk in holiness, O oh God. Lord, we can walk in that revelation of the holiness, O oh Lord, more and more so that we can serve you, O oh Lord, in such a way which pleases you, Father. We surrender everything into your mighty hand. Thank you, Father God, for Lord Master giving the revelation and wisdom to Pastor and Lord Master. And also we thank you that preparing each one of our heart to receive this revelation which is edifying our faith, which is strengthening our relationship with you. We thank you and praise you and ask you, make us the fruitful branch for your kingdom so that we can, Lord Master, we can walk with that essence of that holiness. We can walk with the fruitfulness of your word, Father God. We thank you and praise you for answering our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, everyone. I will uh, see you tomorrow. Enjoy the rest of your day. God bless you. See you again tomorrow. Thanks. Bye now. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Pastor. Thank you for today. <laughs>